Hello, Mr. Fusion here. You can call me Lance if you like. I want to welcome you to a very special episode of Dragon Ball Dissection. Well, you can probably tell things are a little bit different because we're not looking at Dragon Ball manga panels or still from the Dragon Ball television series, but you're in my house looking at my face. And contrary to popular belief, I am on camera in a lot of my videos. I just don't do it for Dragon Ball Dissection. And yet people are always really surprised to see me on camera. Well, here's my face. You're looking at me. This is me. Well, hopefully you've recently gotten done watching Toriyama's soft reboot, Dragon Ball Dissection, The Cell Art Part 6. And I say that because in today's video, I want to take you through the process of making that video. The entire process of Dragon Ball Dissection, from research, to writing, to recording, editing, even making the thumbnail, I want to show you all of that today. So whether you're a longtime Dragon Ball Dissection fan, who's just curious about what goes into it, or maybe you're an aspiring YouTuber yourself and want to have some idea of how to make something like this of your own, hopefully all of you will find something interesting or informative to look at today. But before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about Dragon Ball Dissection, because it's been in my life a very long time, and it's something that's obviously very important to me. Now, I've been doing it for over six years now, but it actually stretches back farther than that. I mean, I've been a Dragon Ball fan nearly 20 years this year. And I remember, when I was a kid, I always wanted to do something Dragon Ball related publicly, have some sort of public face for my Dragon Ball fandom. And back then I wanted to have the next big Dragon Ball fan site. I wanted to be the next Daizenshu EX or Planet Namek or Dragon Ball Z Uncensored, stuff like that. In 10th grade I even took a web design class for a semester, but nothing really ever came of that. But flash forward to 2010, the summer of 2010, and I have been doing my YouTube channel for over a year now. And at that time, I was living in Nashville, and I was working on a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers series, if you guys remember that. It was one of the first things I'd done that really got a lot of attention. And it was uh, comparing the various Super Sentai series that were made at that time and showing how they were adapted into Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Now, during that time, I was in a habit of taking long walks late at night. I would just go around the neighborhood, walk around Music Row or the Vanderbilt campus because that's where I lived, and I would use it to sort of clear my head and get ideas and figure out scripts. And so during that summer I'd be walking around at night thinking about what, how I was going to write these Power Rangers scripts. But that wasn't all I was thinking about. I was thinking about Dragon Ball too. Because while I've never ever really fallen out of Dragon Ball in the entire 20 years, it was definitely reinvigorated around that time with the recent release of the domestic Dragon Ball Z Dragon Boxes, which I was collecting at the time. And in fact, I'd done a couple of Dragon Box reviews before the Power Ranger reviews, which also had been some really early successes of mine. So I was taking those walks and thinking, it'd be cool to do a, a Dragon Ball series on my channel and, and talk about why I think the Red Ribbon Army arc is underrated or talk about how I think it's out of character for Yamcha to be labeled as a cheater, stuff like that I was thinking about all the way back then, eight years ago. And while it took me a while, it was another year and a half before I would get it off the ground, Dragon Ball Dissection was born. I was inspired by stuff like Linkara's history of Power Rangers and the idea that he had of taking something, taking a work that's typically considered kid stuff. Stuff that's usually considered kind of fluffy and doesn't usually have a, a really strong critical lens put over its storytelling and do that. I thought that was fascinating. And he in turn was inspired by SF Debris reviews of the Star Trek series, 
which I'm also a really big fan of, and I took from him the idea of having a 1 through 10 numerical scoring system. And so, in early 2012, I finally launched Dragon Ball Dissection, and it's been going on ever since then. And it's thanks to guys like you, all you people watching, for making it, uh, making it one of the favorite things I do on this channel. For, for always watching, always commenting, always liking or agreeing or disagreeing, just keeping that conversation rolling and keeping Dragon Ball Dissection a very special part of my channel. So with all that said, let's get to it. Let's take a look at how an episode of Dragon Ball Dissection is made. Every episode of Dragon Ball Dissection begins with the source, Dragon Ball. Now, if you watched my other videos, you might have noticed me sitting in front of this shelf, which has a lot of my uh, Dragon Ball resources here. I got the entire manga by Viz, I have two different Daizenchus, I have the Dragon Ball Z Dragon Boxes, and I have the two disc saga sets. I also have Jocko the Galactic Patrolman down there, in case I ever, <laughs> ever get to it. But volumes 29 and 30 you're missing because those are the ones I've been working with lately. Behind me is the Fusion Desk. The nerve center of all my video making, web surfing, even eating, because that's what happens when you put a desk in your dining room. But as I said, the first step to making a Dragon Ball Dissection episode is to do the research. Now why research you ask? Don't, don't I know all this stuff already? For the most part, yes, I have read Dragon Ball many, many, many times, but that doesn't mean I don't need a refresher once in a while. Even though there are lots of things that I know I'm going to say, or that I know I want to talk about, every time I read this, I find new things I never knew I wanted to talk about. Plus, I want to avoid making mistakes. Because I'm not perfect. You guys know I'm not perfect. You've seen me make mistakes. You've seen me have to apologize for mistakes. So the first step in any Dragon Ball Dissection episode, as Kendamu would say, is to read the damn manga. In this case, Volume 30. Now obviously it's not just as simple as opening the manga and reading it. I need some outside sources too to keep me on the straight and narrow. And that's where Kanzenshu.com comes in. Now I've said it multiple times over the years, but it never hurts to say it as many times as I can. Dragon Ball Dissection owes so much to Kanzenshu.com. In fact, I do not even remotely exaggerate when I say that Dragon Ball Dissection would not be possible without the resources of Kanzenshu.com. All the wonderful things they have there, from translations of interviews with Toriyama as editors, anybody else, dating back decades, to their movie guides, their animation styles guides, their television guides with detailed information on staff, and of course, when I'm doing my manga read-through, what's most important is the manga guide that has pages for every single chapter in the manga. If you are a Dragon Ball fan and are not going to Konzenshu on a regular basis, you're just not Dragon Balling right. So, I have the manga, and I have Konzenshu open. The next thing I need is my DBD9 notes file. See, I may not be the most organized person in the world, but I have managed to maintain a pretty consistent numbering scheme for all of my various Dragon Ball Dissection assets. Just makes it easier to find later on. So, basically, it is DBD arc number. Or, in the case of episode-specific assets, DBD arc number underscore episode number. In this case, we're working on the Cell Arc Part 6, so that would be DBD 9 underscore 6. Since in my numberings, the Cell Arc is the ninth arc of the series, and this is the sixth episode of that arc. For movies, it's DBD M number, or DBD Z M number, if it's a Z movie. And for DBD TV, it's DBD TV arc number, and where applicable, underscore episode number. Pretty simple. So, I have an entire picture folder for every single arc, and I also have a notes file for every single arc. In this case, DBD 9 notes. So, while I'm reading, I'm taking notes. What kind of notes? Well, anything. There's really no criteria for it being a note. Just anything that I find interesting, anything I know I want to talk about, anything that catches me off guard, any kind of random observation I think might be useful. Might be things I remember, but just want to make sure I know what chapter it's in so I can find it later on easily. Not everything I take a note on is going to end up in an episode of Dragon Ball Dissection. Sometimes I just don't have enough to say about it or it's not interesting enough. 
but while I'm taking notes, none of that matters. Anything I think of can go into a note. And I don't just use the notes file when I'm actually reading the manga. Sometimes if I have a burst of inspiration, I'll open it up and write down something I know I don't want to forget to talk about later on. If I find a translation, say on Kanzenshi, that I know I'm going to want to quote later on, I make sure to copy and paste that into my notes file as well. So after I finish reading each chapter, I go through the corresponding episode on the Kanzenshu manga guide to see if there are any translation notes or mistakes I might not have noticed, or just to read Toriyama's chapter notes. Every week that Dragon Ball was in Weekly Shonen Jump, Toriyama had notes to go along with it, and sometimes they can be silly, and occasionally they can be useful, like when he mentions Kondo Yu taking over as his editor. But those aren't the only notes that I have. Back in 2014, when I was thinking of adding DVD TV to the lineup, I started taking notes on the TV series using this. My furry purple skull and crossbones journal. It was a Secret Santa gift. Now, when I was taking notes with that, I would have the TV series open on one monitor. On another monitor, I would have open the website Kenny Sue's Dragon Ball music documentation, something else I highly recommend. It allowed me to keep up with various musical cues and learn what they were. And so I would take notes while doing both of those things. I'd also have the manga open as well, following along for, well, obviously manga material. For filler, I didn't have to do that. Now, these were primarily useful for Dragon Ball Dissection TV episodes, but it could be useful for the manga material as well. For example, sometimes I'd have translation questions. While this is a pretty competent translation of the manga, I still trust the subtitles done by Clyde Mandolin and Steve Simmons for the TV series more than I trust Viz. So if I'm following along in the manga while I'm watching the television series and I notice a really big translation discrepancy between the two of them, I'll make a note of it and figure out which one is real later on, which is very helpful for all Dragon Ball dissection episodes. And sometimes I would just make general notes. It's just really helpful to get two different sets of perspectives from myself from two different time periods because I don't notice everything every time. It's really nice to have a different perspective. As an aside, you might have noticed that in my notes document, I use the original Japanese chapter numbers as opposed to splitting it up into Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z like Viz does. At this point, it's pretty unconscious. I've been reading the manga for so long that I can pretty much make the adjustment in my head automatically. It's really simple. You just take the Viz chapter number, add 200, subtract 6. Next we come to writing, and writing the script might just be the most important part of Dragon Ball Dissection. I mean, without a script, there wouldn't be a video. And while I try to add as much visual flair into it as possible, at the end of the day, Dragon Ball Dissection largely just consists of essays. You know, it's my analysis, my critiques, my dissecting you guys come here to hear, right? So, the script is very, very important. And it's also the opportunity for me to make my biggest, most embarrassing mistakes, as you guys all know. So, writing can be the hardest part of a Dragon Ball Dissection episode. Now, it's probably a common misconception that I can just take my notes and expand them pretty much verbatim and in order to make a script. And it really, well... It can kind of work that way, but not completely. See, by the nature of Dragon Ball Dissection, at least the manga episodes, they are all fairly chronological in structure. As in, I am following along in the story and breaking away to comment on things that interest me. But if you stick too closely to that, you just end up with a bunch of word vomit, really. There has to be a pacing, there has to be a flow, there has to be a structure. Things have to segue from one to the next. You can't just say, oh, then this happened, and then this happened. I'm going to talk about this, and then I'm going to move on to this. It just, it starts to get a little bit unpleasant to sit through. There has to be a flow. Things have to segue from one to the next. And like I said before, not everything in my notes ends up in the episode. Because sometimes it's just not interesting enough, or I don't have enough to say about it and it ends up being obscure, nerdy trivia you neither knew nor cared about. So, it's, it's not something I can explain logically, writing a script. It's not something that I can really sort of put a finger on to what makes a script work and what doesn't. It's just a lot of the times I know when it works and I know when it doesn't. And sometimes I'm lucky enough that most of it works on the first try, and sometimes I end up banging my head against the wall 
for days trying to get the script the way I want it to be. Sometimes it just doesn't work and I can't figure out why. And I do have a recent example of that, actually. So in the Cell Arc Part 5, I'd written the script and I had to step away from it, and it just wasn't working for me. I was having a hard time pinpointing exactly why that was. Towards the end, I'd gotten to the point in the story where Trunks saves his, uh, his baby self and his mother from Dr. Garrow blowing up their car, which leads to the first confrontation with Vegeta. And I had written a big paragraph about that, about how this sets everything up and the conflict and all this stuff. And I just realized, while it was good stuff on its own, it didn't fit into this episode. I was getting near the end of the script, and here I was introducing a brand new plot point that was taking up a large amount of space, and it was all stuff I was going to have to reiterate in the next episode anyway, when that stuff really started to take on its own life. And here it was kind of sitting here, making no sense. So at the end of the day, I just cut it out, started my DVD 9 underscore 6 file early, threw all that stuff in there, and so now I'm adding it to this episode. Now, that's the danger in writing chronologically. It has its benefits, too, because, well, it, it provides its own structure automatically that you can just follow for the most part. And sometimes my hardest videos to write are the ones where they're more topic-based, like the movies or DVD TV, because I have to figure out what the structure is going to be. I break it up by topic and topic, like music or story or animation, things like that. And it becomes difficult to get that one to work properly. Like, for example, when I did Dragon Ball Z Movie 2, The World's Strongest Guy, that took me so many drafts. I just kept on writing and rewriting, and it just never seemed to come together the way I wanted it to. So writing chronologically helps because it already has that formula set up for it. But it's a danger, too, because when you start getting into overarching character threads and plot threads, things that aren't just showing up once and then that's it, it makes it difficult to know when to talk about certain things. Because, for example, Vegeta and Trunks butting heads happens all throughout the arc. When do I talk about that? If I literally just bring it up every single time it happens, then not only is it becoming redundant, I'm sort of missing the larger picture there by just breaking it down each time and bringing it up every single time. So that's how you end up with episodes like, Is Goku a Hero? or the Battle Powers episode, where I just sort of put it all aside until I think it's time to talk about it, and then tackle it all at once rather than unpacking it time, 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 time. It has much more impact when you just do it in one sitting. The problem is, is that it sometimes leads to what SF Debris has coined, you forgotism. It's that little voice you hear in your head when you're making a video where you go, if I don't put this in the review, people will think I've forgotten about it and it just nags at you all the time, when the truth usually isn't about forgetting. It's either I don't feel it fits in the video, it's not interesting enough for me to talk about, or more likely it's just I'm going to talk about it, I'm just not going to talk about it right now, so please stop commenting on it, please. So the way writing ultimately goes is that I will just write a first draft, have all the words spill out onto the page, then I'll leave it alone for a day or so and come back and read it again. I'll read it out loud, timing myself to see about how long a video it'll make and to see how easy it is to say the things that I've written and hopefully I'll catch any mistakes I might have made. So I'll revise things, uh, tighten up the word choice, make it flow a little bit better and hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll be ready for recording. <laughs> And now we get to the recording, and that's one of the areas of Dragon Ball Dissection where the technology has changed over the years. Now, I'm not saying I have anything really super sophisticated for my setup and the spare, no expense, hoity-toity, awesome professional grade filmmaking equipment. I don't make enough money off of this for that. But I have managed to improve things over the years, buy some new stuff, and that's where I've seen some improvement, hopefully. So when I first started Dragon Ball Dissection, I just used this my video camera. It was the same video camera I used in all my other videos. But I'm not on camera for Dragon Ball Dissection, so all I needed was the audio. What I would do would be to just plop myself down in front of the camera and read my script into the microphone, and then in editing I would cut out all the video footage. So if you ever saw my Dragon Ball Dissection videos from very early on, the raw footage would look like this. Dragon Ball had managed to complete a year of serialization in Weekly Shonen Jump, 
Whether following Toriyama's initial guesses into the length of the series based on time, that he thought it would run for about a year, or a story that he initially planned to end after the first hunt for the Dragon Balls, the series had now passed both of those milestones, so it's fair to say Dragon Ball was, if it hadn't been before, in completely uncharted territory. The problem is, onboard camera microphones just aren't that good, usually. You can always hear the hum of the camera in the background. The problem is, onboard camera microphones just aren't that good, usually. You can always hear the hum of the camera in the background. So after I've been doing DVD for about a year, I got this. Just a standard USB blue snowball microphone. Cost about $70. And on it I have a pop filter, which I'm embarrassed to say I only just got, and only because of this making of video. DVD 9.6 is the first time I'm actually using it. It only cost about $7. But back when I was recording things on my camera, I didn't need to worry about having a program to record things in. But Vegito EX put me onto the program Audacity when I was recording Konzenshu the podcast with him, and now I use that to record all of my audio footage. But while I do everything else pretty much at the desk right here, I do my recording in the bedroom, and that's because the sound isn't quite as good in here. I have the kitchen right over there, there are all a lot of hard surfaces for sounds to bounce off of. In the bedroom there's obviously a bed and softer surfaces to absorb things like echoes. But I still try to make the best sort of sound presentation I possibly can, although I'm really no expert. But I make sure all kind of noises are turned off, air conditioning's turned off, fans, the refrigerator, stuff like that. And that ensures I get the best quality sound that I can. Now, I'm much more comfortable doing scripted reviews because I can do things as many times as I want to until I get them right. It's not just like I'm sitting in front of a camera doing a vlog and just kind of winging it. But I'm not perfect. So it often takes me many times to get things the way I want them to. I flub things. I usually spend at least half an hour recording. In this case, for this video, I spent 40 minutes doing it. And since the videos are usually in the range of 15 minutes long, clearly, I flub a lot. And the worst part is, since I'm doing this all by myself, sometimes I don't even recognize I've made a mistake until I'm listening to what I already recorded, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But once I'm done recording, I do use a plug-in for Audacity called NoiseGate to filter out small sounds, like the sound of me breathing or just any kind of random small hums that might get in the way. So after the research and the writing and the recording comes the editing, which is the most time-consuming part of Dragon Ball Dissection. Now, when I first started Dragon Ball Dissection, I was using this, my old compact laptop, which is the computer I started using when I was first making videos for this channel. And even by the time Dragon Ball Dissection had started in 2012, it was already kind of on its last legs. It had to be hooked up to an external monitor and an external keyboard just to be usable. So after the first arc, I moved to the appropriately bento-shaped ThinkPad. So cute. And on both of those computers, I used the editing software Pinnacle Studio 12, which I got for Christmas of 2008. It wasn't exactly professional grade quality software, but it got the job done. Its biggest shortcoming was the fact that it only allowed for three video tracks, which could sometimes cause a problem. On the rare occasion I really needed more than three video tracks, I had to get creative sometimes in how to make that work. Another big problem is that it corrupted project files a lot. Sometimes I could go through three or even four projects just for one video. And to keep this video family friendly, I won't share with you what I would name some of the later issue project files once I'd really gotten angry. But what really killed the ThinkPad for me was when it started overheating. First it wasn't too bad, but then it started happening all the time, to the point that I needed to keep ice trays under it just to keep it working. I would literally sit up with it to watch it render just to make sure that it wouldn't shut off while I was asleep and therefore not have a video ready when I wanted it to be. But by that point it was about 10 years old, so it really wasn't worth trying to fix. So once it got intolerable, I finally just buckled under and paid for Final Cut Pro for my MacBook Pro and I've never looked back. So the audio file I recorded serves as the backbone to the project. Now, I could cut it in Audacity, but I'm just more comfortable using a video editor for that. So I plop it into Final Cut Pro and I start cutting out all the bad parts. Now, 
If I've done multiple takes of a line, which is often, the waveforms will look similar, so a lot of times, to save time, I'll just move to the last take and cut everything else out before that. It's the easiest part of editing, but there's not really a lot of interesting things to talk about, so let's just skip on right to the end there. Hey, look at that! What was originally about 40 minutes has been chopped down to less than 20. That's exciting. So, now it's time for the video, which in this case, for the most part, are Dragon Ball manga pages. So, I have the entire Kanzenban digitized, and it's separated by volume, so I can pick and choose whatever I want, but I still keep the Viz manga handy, because it's much easier to find a page I'm looking for by flipping through a physical volume than it is trying to search through all of these thousands of little thumbnails. Plus, since I'm not fluent in Japanese, if I'm looking for a particular line, it's much easier to find what I'm looking for in the Viz manga, where it's in English, rather than trying to figure out what panel I need from the Japanese. Editing for Dragon Ball Dissection is relatively simplistic. This isn't like some big visual effects smorgasbord here. But, in order to have some kind of visual dynamics with what I'm showing you, it is very lucky that I have such high quality scans because I can do a lot with them. It's a lot of zooming in, zooming out, panning across, moving across things in different directions. It's not a huge amount of things to do, but it does help me to focus in on certain panels or to move across the action from talking about multiple things on a page at once. That does mean I have to hand animate every single one of them, start at a certain point, set the keyframe, move to the next one, and again, it's not really hard, uh, and it's not all that interesting to watch or even to do because, again, it's not great visual effects type stuff. But while it is easy and relatively simple, they do kind of add up over time. So, in this case, this particular video, which is not a really intensive Dragon Ball Dissection episode, this is a fairly standard boilerplate episode, honestly, it had 371 separate edits. So, for simple ones where, say, I'm just panning across or doing a slow zoom on something, that can take eh, maybe around a minute to edit that, but add in a few hundred of those, and suddenly you're looking at a pretty decent amount of time. Then when you have edits where I have large amounts of different panels on screen at the same time, where I have to crop certain things and zoom and pan and do all that, on just one section, that can take four to five minutes just for that one little section. So, add them up over time, it does take a decent amount of time to edit these sometimes. And that's not even factoring in the time it takes to find the page I'm looking for, or even to decide what page or pages to use. Now, for example, when I'm talking about specific actions in the manga, I know I want to use that specific page. And all I have to do is find it, which, again, can take some time with thumbnails and flipping through, you know how it goes. But what about when I have larger, broader topics to talk about? Then I really have to start thinking about what I want to use. I want to dig back into older volumes and shuffle through those pages and find references to older things I'm talking about. That takes time as well. Now, my little secret sometimes, my little somewhat lazy secret, is that when I'm doing topics and just need to find something to move across, something to fill up space, Chapter title pages are really good for that. I can zoom in really tight on them and then zoom out, or the opposite, and have that take up 30 seconds to an entire minute sometimes of me talking. And that makes for a much quicker edit. I try not to overuse that, but sometimes it actually really looks good. Final Cut Pro makes the process a lot easier, not that I'm a pitch man for it, but you know, it helps that the computer is not always lagging or overheating, stuff like that but also because I can make a lot of presets for things. Like, I have my own custom drop shadow, and a really great feature is the fact that I can make to-do lists. Like, if I am really in the mood just to cut audio or just to throw in video, I, I can add a little marker on there to say, oh, I'll add in this text later, or oh, I'll find this certain image here later. And it makes a handy little list for me, which if I click it, it'll take me right to the spot where I missed it before. Now, in the past, before I had this feature, I would just have to play back the entire video when I was done and realize, oh, I forgot to add that certain thing in there. But having that list really helps me keep things organized. And when I do Dragon Ball Dissection TV episodes, I have special framing for the stills to cut out like the, the top tape marks and the edges of the frame to make it look a lot smoother. 
Now, I don't have any problem using uh, video footage in my videos. Because, I mean, if you've watched anything else I do in this channel, like Batman or stuff like that, you know I can use video, so it's not a technical limitation. It's just, Dragon Ball Dissection is kind of my baby, and the powers that be can be a little copyright strike happy with these. I don't want these videos to be taken down, so I always use stills just for safety reasons. And no, I'm not gonna reverse flip the images because that just looks unprofessional to me. So once in a while I do something different with editing, just add some more pizzazz or have a little visual gag I like to throw in there. Like, my personal favorite, for example, is at the end of the Cyan arc, where I talk about flying and how Goku might not have known that Gohan could fly. I had that little gag in there where Goku lets go of Gohan and he falls out of the frame, and I just really enjoyed doing that. Uh, because anytime I can add any kind of real animation into this, so it's not just, you know, manga pages, it's a lot of fun. And if that wasn't made so long ago, I could show you how I did that, but it was pretty simple, really. Just opening the page into an image editor, isolating Gohan from the page, so it just had, just had that image of Gohan, and then taking the page and cutting Gohan out of that, and then sort of smoothing over those edges where he was cut out. So you had just Gohan, and then the page without Gohan, then just plopping Gohan on top of that, and so when the moment came, I could animate him falling out of the frame, and there was just Goku left. It's funny that Goku assumes his son knows how to fly because he has no problem just letting him go in midair. It's very fortunate that Gohan didn't face plant 50 feet up. <laughs> and finally, I love the fact that I do reuse the same opening sequence for the entire arc. With the exception of the one I made for the Red Ribbon Arc Part 6, where I made a special Dr. Slump dissection opening, which was also a lot of fun. But, it's nice in the fact that while they do take a lot of time to put together, especially the one I made for the Cell Arc, because I had to learn a whole new program just to make that. Once it's done, then, well, that's an asset I can keep using. So I can just throw it into the, the timeline for the new video, and it's there for me. There's no extra work to be done. That's just, it's just, it's money in the bank already. Now, I invariably make mistakes. And if I'm really lucky, I'll catch them before the video goes out to the public. Sometimes I'm not so lucky. But regardless, there is almost always a period of revising after the editing is started. Sometimes I flub a line. A lot of times, I flub a line. There have been times where I'll say the wrong character's name even though it's written properly on my script. And I don't even notice it until I'm playing it back and editing it. So I gotta go back and re-record that. Or, I figure out a mistake I have in the script, even though I've written it and revised that script and re-read it and recorded it, suddenly a mistake will jump out at me, some inaccurate line of dialogue, so I gotta re-record that. Or sometimes, I'll just think of something new I wanted to say and just throw that into the video as well. So, I have to go back and re-record things. Now when I'm doing that, I'll play the edited audio track on my headphones so that I can match the intonation, the volume, the pitch, things like that. Because, I don't know about you, but it drives me crazy when I'm watching a video and I can really obviously tell that some section was recorded at a different time. The audio quality is just different or something like that. So I try really hard to make sure that these new edits fit in seamlessly. So this is also the part where I tend to get help. Now I sometimes have questions I alone can't answer and sometimes I can't even find on the magical world wide web. So sometimes I'll post a question in the Kanzenchu forums, or sometimes I'll just take it to Twitter because I'm friends with a lot of people who know a lot about Dragon Ball, and they can answer questions for me. Now I actually have a couple of examples of this. Back in part 5, I opened the video by talking about Vegeta's late Frieza arc armor and how that armor never appears again anywhere else in the series. But I got in enough trouble lately by saying things have never happened only to find some really obscure factoid out there in the middle of nowhere the moment I post the video. So I wanted to be extra careful with this one. Just anytime I throw the word never in there lately, I just kind of go, eh, I really want to be extra special sure about that. So I put it out to Twitter, and within a few minutes, 
people had found an example from the uh, Mecha Frieza fight. And while in a lot of cases that might have ruined my point, it actually kind of made it better for me in this instance, because my main point was that you don't see this past armor in the past, and while I did have that never line in there, the fact that you only see it again even further in the future was even funnier to me. So I quickly went back and re-recorded that line and that was saved. Another example from the same video was the line about Luma not knowing that Dr. Gero was a member of the Red Ribbon Army. A line I'd never really noticed before until I was writing that script. Because it's a line that was corrected in the TV version. They took that out as far as I could tell. But I wasn't entirely sure if that was a Viz problem that they added in that mistaken line and that's why it wasn't in the TV series, or if it was an actual correction the TV series made because the line in the manga was wrong. Again, I'm not fluent in Japanese, but it did look as though it was correct to me. I was able to pick out the words Dr. Gero and Red Ribbon Army from the Japanese panel. But just to be absolutely sure, I put that panel to my Twitter followers and was able to get clarification that, that was indeed what the line said, so that was able to stay in the video. So now with all the revisions done and the editing changed to reflect those, the video is finally ready to go out to the public. But there's still one more tiny step, and that's making the thumbnail. Now when I first started doing custom thumbnails for my videos, which was the Piccolo Arc Part 5, it was pretty simple. I would just use the video editing software, grab a screenshot from the video that I already made, throw in the same text font I use in the videos, throw in the logo, and, and that was it. That was a thumbnail. I then started making thumbnails in an image editing software, GIMP, which I really enjoy doing. And that allowed me to get more creative with thumbnails. So lately it's not just been a snapshot of a manga page, but I've been able to mix and match things together and get some creative results. It's got a little bit easier with the cell work because I use the template from the opening to give it all a distinctive look, and then just uh, plop in panels from pages to reflect the, uh, the events of the episode. But there have been a few lately that I've really enjoyed working on, like the ones for DVD TV. Like, I loved recreating that part from the manga where it shows the little panels of every, everybody in front of Shenlong, which was never really recreated in the TV series, so I had to sort of get creative and find similar shots in the TV series and put all those together and find all the Dragon Balls and isolate those, and there were so many different layers to work with, and I really loved making that as much time as it took me to do. That was really rewarding. Same thing with the Cyan arc for DVD TV, where I had to recreate a chapter title page that was not in the TV series, and trying to find similar, similar shots, even though a lot of those shots didn't even exist in the TV series at all. I had to make a composite of a, of a, of a pan across the Son family home and just put all those pieces together. That was a lot of fun too. So, thumbnails, they usually take a lot of time, and it certainly didn't in this case, but there are some times where I put some extra effort into those, and those can be really fun to do. And so, that's basically it, the making of an episode of Dragon Ball Dissection. Now, like I said, this was a pretty easy one to make. I didn't have a lot of rewrites to do. The script came out pretty easily. There weren't any crazy animations to make, but I did go to the trouble of timing everything I did for this one because I was curious as well to see how long it usually took me to make one of these. I never really timed myself before. So let's, uh, let's go to the data, shall we? For research, I spent 50 minutes. Writing was 118 minutes. Recording, 46 minutes. Editing, like I said, this is where a lot of the time goes, 477 minutes. Revising, 89 minutes, and the thumbnail, 33 minutes, for a total of 813 minutes, which is the equivalent of just over 13 and a half hours. Whew, that made me tired just reading it. Well, I have a lot of fun making Dragon Ball Dissection, and I hope this video has allowed you guys to get a better understanding of what it takes to make one. So, thanks for watching. There'll be another Dragon Ball Dissection episode pretty soon. Hope you enjoy and keep on enjoying Dragon Ball Dissection. Thank you all for watching and let me know what you think of this. Have a good day, guys.